Hey, my name is Patrick O'Callaghan, and many of you know me as Ciderhelm. So today I'm going to talk about self-employment and how you can make a living for yourself within the gaming industry or any other online industry. Uh, the advice I'm going to give applies to writers, video creators, streamers, data miners, programmers, salesmen, and even pro gamers. And frankly, any of these skills can independently carry you to success. Now, I've chosen the title Six Figures because many people in the audience have heard that phrase thrown about when discussing some pro gamers. So before we jump into this, let me clarify that this video is for those of you who want to get started or who are already started and it's meant to help you on your journey towards success. Even if you just want to earn a few hundred dollars on the side, this is for you. When you're just starting out, it's hard to find information about a lot of these subjects because so many sources are either vague or they're written by salespeople trying to promote a particular product. My pledge to you is that I'm going to give you all the information I've thought to write down over the last week because I'm passionate about it and because I want you to succeed. And in doing so, I'll avoid selling or berating any particular networks or products. The only thing I ask is that if the information helps you or your friends or your family, uh, you like this video and you tell somebody about it. So understand that I won't be talking about your core skill. If you want to improve as, say, a video creator or any other pursuit, you want to research those directly. And this is not even about the exact plan of action you'll need to take to become a success. Instead, I'm going to give you tons of advice and information I wish I had known when I first became an entrepreneur. There's a lot of wisdom here, and I'd suggest you stick through the whole thing, take notes, and come back anytime you want to remember what I've said. So first off, let me introduce myself as it relates to this discussion. I consider myself a fairly successful person with multiple different projects I'm involved in and a healthy income. I've been self-employed for about seven years and my income supports our family of three in an area with a moderately high cost of living. Here are the good parts of self-employment. First, you set your own schedule and your work hours. So this means if you're someone who works better in the evening, you can work in the evening. Uh, this also means that you can avoid competing with traffic and long lines at places you don't want to go to, or that, you, that rather you do want to go to. Second, you can choose where you want to live, provided there's an internet connection that supports what you're trying to accomplish. So for video stuff, you're going to need a higher or better inter internet connection. Obviously for live streaming, you'll need an even better internet connection, but you do have some flexibility. Uh, and for someone like myself who enjoys nature, and I don't particularly enjoy large cities, this is a huge plus. So if you love cities anyway, maybe it's not such a big thing for you. Now third, vacations are awesome. You never have to compete with holiday traffic if you don't want to, and you can pick up and go whenever you've got your other work in order. So last year, for instance, we took a trip, road trip to Yellowstone after having the idea the previous afternoon, and there are usually good deals for flexible travelers. And of course, this implies that you may get to spend more time with your family, and that's one of the things that I personally love. So fourth and finally, I am directly rewarded for my work. I don't ever worry that I'm being paid too little for my work because my pay is directly tied to my performance. Being an entrepreneur is by far the most personally gratifying work available in my opinion. Now, depending on contracts you decide to pick up, this won't always be the case, but you'll also get to negotiate these contracts once you establish yourself. I'll talk about this towards the end of this video. All right, enough with the glamour. There are some pretty huge downsides to being self-employed. First, there are a lot of vulnerable layers you're relying on. Depending on what you're pursuing, you may be relying on your internet connection, your web posts, your payment processors, and the YouTube platform. In the gaming industry, we need the support of gaming companies. Gaming companies that actively allow and even promote content creators and allow them to monetize are an ideal environment for us to flourish. And Riot Games happens to be one of the few of gaming companies that excels at this. Though it's a great game and there's a solid team behind it, there's absolutely a correlation between the popularity of League and their support of independent content creators, be they YouTube authors or live streamers. And of course, we also have to worry about potential internet censorship laws. These are incredibly dangerous to content creators like myself, and they succeed in creating a chilling effect. Now the second thing is taxes in the United States are rough for the self-employed and they require a lot more planning and preparation than is necessary for normal employment. I'm not bringing up the country to compare it positively or negatively to other countries, but rather because I want to make it clear that's where my personal experience is. Third, health insurance in the United States is also a big issue, especially if you're supporting a family. Now, our rates have jumped up over the last year or so and being self-employed, we don't have the bargaining power that companies do. Fourth and finally, you're responsible for buying all of your work equipment. This goes without saying. You don't need much to get started, though when you only have one computer and you're completely relying on it, any kind of problem can seriously cost you. 
The bottom line is that self-employment offers an incredible amount of freedom, while normal employment can offer more security if you're not working low-skilled jobs. Both are great, and you don't want to totally prevent yourself from one path or the other. As a new father, I've come to really appreciate the value of security, and I can easily see myself going for normal employment someday if the situation warranted. That said, there are a number of ways to add security to self-employment, and I'm going to discuss those a little later. So what do you need to get started? This is a broad question, so I'm going to answer it a number of different ways. So first, what's your financial circumstance and how much free time do you have? It sounds counterintuitive, but the best possible situation you can be in is working a dead-end job while living with your parents. Or alternatively, you're in college and you're failing your classes. Or you've just been laid off from your job and finding a new job will take a while. This is because these are bad situations, but they give you the time and motivation to get out of them. As a frontier, and as an opportunity for upward mobility, the internet is absolutely incredible, and this only grows outward. Once I established myself, I began hiring others to work for me. Among these were a couple people who were financially at rock bottom. These are people you may know, and they've been able to establish better lives for themselves as a result of my own success. Now, if you're listening to this and you've already got children or other financial responsibilities, you must prepare a plan and set up a savings account first. You won't get nearly as many breaks or opportunities, but it's still worth pursuing if it's a passion for you. As a somewhat related subject, there's a question of whether it's a good idea to drop out of school to pursue dreams like this. It's different for everyone. For me, I have no regrets at all about dropping out of college, but I only did it once I had a really strong feeling about that things were going to work out well for me. I tend to think that college is frequently overvalued, unless you're involved in fields that actually require a lot of knowledge, such as hard sciences, engineering, medicine, or law. But by the same token, having a degree is helpful to fall back on before you built up a resume. The second thing to keep in mind is your personality and your willingness to learn. Developing a strategy for achieving your goals by yourself and actually implementing it requires you be willing to learn anything that isn't immediately accessible to you, either from friends or family. Consume absolutely everything you come across. If you're weak in an area, emulate others who handle that area well. If you come across something that takes your interest, learn everything you can about it and try everything at least once. Now, don't worry too much about what you perceive as personality flaws. A lot of the times, those personality flaws will actually wind up being positive traits. For me, I can focus on a single subject for 14 hours a day, but I usually won't focus on that same subject for two weeks straight. I love variety, and I'm passionate about a lot of different things. Growing up, I felt that this was a huge flaw because I struggled to focus on different school subjects, and it didn't really take long-term projects well. Today, I consider this one of my biggest strengths because it encourages me to shift gears frequently, work on a variety of projects, learn new things, and gain new perspectives. Have you been told that you're not a hard worker or you don't apply yourself? Ignore it. I've been there and I've discovered I have an incredible drive when I'm doing things I love and making my living off it. And there's room for all types of personalities. I tell you it's important to be a tactful person or a respectful person, but the reality is everyone has a place at the table. The third thing to consider for getting started is the actual monetary cost of your pursuit. This discussion really isn't about hardware or software, but you need to be very open about whether your computer can handle the work you're trying to do. This is especially true for video work and even more true for any type of live streaming. My entire initial investment in self-employment was less than $200, and most of that was for a vBulletin license, which there are plenty of free alternatives to. But if you want to pursue video work or live streaming and need to start from scratch, meaning a whole new computer, you could run a very good setup for this at about $1,500 or less, including the microphone and the camera. Money does not create success, and tons of people waste tons of money chasing bad ideas. You work with what you have, you find ways to make things work when you don't have much. Alright, we've covered the pros and cons at this point, as well as what you need to get started. Now I want to jump into the discussion of how you succeed. I'm going to cover a huge variety of topics here. The most important thing to getting started is find a subject you're passionate about. I mean this both in terms of your core skills, such as writing or programming or video production, but for many projects it also applies to the subject matter. Outside of being a physically attractive person, you are unlikely to succeed when people catch on that you don't particularly care about what you're doing. For me, I was very passionate about World of Warcraft. More specifically, I loved tanking in World of Warcraft, and this led to writing guides on the official forums, which in turn led to me creating TankSpot. 
Tankspot and a handful of other specific sites did phenomenally well, while multi-game networks did a spectacularly bad job by comparison. The problem with these large networks is that they were interested in the financial opportunities of expanding to the new game, but they weren't personally invested in the game itself, nor were they interested in improving on their own sites. They were producing very vague content for an audience that wanted very specific information. In other words, a site that loses is a site that rehashes a press release about a new dungeon being released. The site that wins is the one telling you exactly what gear is available in that dungeon, or exactly how to clear the dungeon, or how to prepare for it and get your mods up to date, etc. On a side note, that doesn't mean you should stick to one game or one genre. To the degree possible, if you're doing content that relies on being very invested in a game, such as professional level play or high-end PvP, you should consider moving to the games with larger audiences, provided you'll be passionate about those games as well. In other words, when possible, play the game that people are playing. It's worth getting into one other related subject now. Covering a lot of different games is a viable option and some big names on YouTube do exactly this. This may seem like a good idea since you can jump into game reviews, let's plays, or other clips with little to no game knowledge, but the problem is that everyone else can too. It's essentially the equivalent of a minimum wage job in that there's an extreme amount of competition and it's very hard to establish yourself as a leader in the field these days. If you're going to pursue variety coverage, you need to bring something stellar to the table to set yourself apart. And by the way, humor is always good. If you're funny, you can establish yourself nearly anywhere by just keeping at it. The second most important thing in getting started is deciding what you want to deliver. You need to come up with your winning idea. There are three main options to establish yourself, and these may help you come up with your idea. First, you can deliver something that has no competition. In other words, find a niche and fill it. This is huge, and it requires you get a spark on what the community may want to see. It's also experimental, so be willing to fail a few times while finding a good place. With my most successful work, filling a niche and doing very well in that niche has been the core reason for success. Second, you can deliver something better than your competition. This isn't quite as good as filling a niche because your competition will have an established audience that can be very hard to pull from. A good example of this approach being successful is Team Solo Mid's guide website. What they brought over their competition was a high level of quality control, where only the, only the guides from very good players were placed at the top. While this didn't mean every individual guide was better than the competition, it did mean that the reader always knew there'd be a baseline of quality and they could trust the site. On the flip side, it's very difficult for other sites to pull significant traffic away from solo mid these days. The third approach, you can deliver something faster than your competition. This tends to be extremely good, especially when it involves data mining information that isn't otherwise available to the public. A classic example of this is MMO Champion, which established itself almost entirely on very smart and quick data mining of World of Warcraft. It was perfectly catered to an audience that craved information about upcoming patches. When you're deciding what to deliver, I'd recommend you avoid becoming a talking head unless you've got a very strong personality or you're otherwise going to keep an audience interested. Specifically, I'm referring to video blogging or vlogging where most of your content consists of talking into a webcam like I'm doing right now. Like multi-game coverage channels, this has flooded the market and only a small handful of users ever become truly successful without having other types of content to buoy them up. And it's fair to say the same principle applies to writing. Very few people are going to care about your personal blog unless you've established yourself in some more meaningful way. Once you're working on a subject that you're passionate about and you have your winning idea, you'll need confidence and perseverance. Now honestly, I can't tell you to be confident in your work because I know most of you won't be. When you're just getting started and you don't have any projects under your belt, it's hard to really know if you're doing the right thing, and maybe you're not. But as you develop your project and move forward with it, you'll start to get an idea of what works. And unless you're doing something incredibly funny, chances are you're going to start getting tons and tons of negative feedback while you've still got rough edges. There's two main things you need to remember when looking at feedback. First, someone can be a jerk and they can still be right. When you're just getting started, one of the hardest things to deal with is someone dogging on every mistake you've made and calling you out as a terrible creator. But one of the biggest mistakes I see newer content creators make is stonewalling everything those people say as though none of it can possibly be true. 
To succeed, you need to look at all criticism, polite or otherwise, and get an idea of the truth in it. I know it's not an ideal part of internet lives, but it also goes without saying that you need to have a bit of a thick skin. If someone upsets you, take your focus off it for a while until you can consider it objectively. So the second part of criticism is this. Constructive criticism should not always be followed. Even the best intentioned people are often going to give you advice that simply isn't very good, and it can be hard to know if these people actually have any clue what they're talking about. Accept the advice gracefully, but trust your gut and do what you believe is right. If you've got talent and you're really passionate, you are going to be able to develop a compass that will help you filter good ideas. Now, not taking all criticism certainly shouldn't imply that you're not constantly seeking to improve your work. I have flaws, and by extension my work has flaws, so I very frequently challenge myself to improve the quality of work and to try new things. Anytime I can find the time and the passion, I will work on improving some aspect of my work, be it a website overhaul, improved editing, or anything else. Love your work. Study other people's work to see how you can improve your own. Take harsh words in stride, filter out the bad criticism, but keep the good, and make sure you don't sacrifice your personal vision. I mentioned perseverance as well. You'll find that the longer you persevere, the less your success relies on luck. Brand new content creators can break out with platforms like Reddit, but simply keeping at a good concept long enough will very likely establish your name. And the cool thing about releasing content over a period of time is it's more and more likely that it will catch one of those big breaks with exposure. I've told this story a few times, but I switched from covering MMORPGs to League of Legends when my son was a few months away from being born. I liked both MMORPGs and League of Legends, but I didn't want to be committing to long raid hours with a newborn. When I went into League of Legends, I told my wife and my audience that I would make this our full-time job. We still had a couple other sources of income at the time, but I wanted to make League our primary revenue stream within a fairly short period of time. Now, I could do this because I had a few things going for me. First, I had the confidence in the quality of my work and my ability to find a solid niche. Second, I had the perseverance to stick it out long enough to get that traction. And third, I had the experience to know that this was likely to work out. And honestly, almost anyone could do what I did and become a successful or, and become a success as a League of Legends content creator or in any other major game. Now, it may seem like I already had an audience and I didn't have to work at it, but my MMORPG audience virtually disappeared when I made the switch. This is because the work I do tends to focus on people who are really heavily invested in a single game. I was bleeding out an enormous amount of MMO subscribers on my YouTube channel, and the only reason a visitor wouldn't have noticed this is that I was also starting to gain decent subscribers from the League of Legends community. When I moved from MMO to MMO, and when I moved to an entirely different genre, I was able to build a very solid community each time. It can be done, and it's not just a matter of being lucky, so take some inspiration from that. Let's talk about monetization. In other words, how you generate money from your projects. For a long time, I didn't earn money from my work. I knew my work was popular, but rather than charging money for my work, I asked for donations to help cover expenses. It took me about a year of being fairly successful before I came to the realization that I was either going to need to turn it into a serious source of income, or I'd need to stop creating content. Before we get into more specific concepts regarding monetizing, there's one basic message you need to understand. Your time is worth something. Your life and your family is worth everything. No matter what anyone else says, if you love what you're doing and you're providing something that people want, you deserve to succeed financially. Many of the best-known content creators produce new content year after year, and they tend to be earning a great income. But doing it for a long time is not what generates the income. Instead, generating the income is usually what allows them to pursue it for a long time. I frequently see people come up with these incredible videos or websites and then watch those same projects die out as a creator loses the motivation to keep doing it. Part of this is often because a creator isn't sticking in it for the long haul, but the other part is that they bought into this idea that they should be creating their content for free, and when reality hits and they need to pay the bills, they lose interest and love for the project. A lot of incredible projects have stopped because of this, and this is something I'll bring up a little bit more when we talk about contracts. A long time ago, I tried to straddle the line between earning an income and respecting the community, the group of people within the community that was opposed to any kind of monetization.
Whenever I did this, I was working for people who frankly were the exact same people who would never compensate me for my work. In everything I've done to monetize, from putting up banner advertisements to writing my first ebook, I've had people talking about how suddenly, just then, I've crossed the line and sold out. Don't worry about these comments. The people making them are not necessarily bad people, they're just idealistic and vocal. Most of your audience will understand, and again, if you invest your life in something that people want, you deserve to be able to earn your living from it. Your audience wants you to be able to keep making this content. So when do you ask for money? As far as websites, one rule of thumb that I've always liked was that you should build your community first before worrying about monetizing. You can hurt yourself in the long run if you're too focused on grabbing cash too quickly. For videos and some other types of projects, if you've got a good product, you can jump in pretty quickly. The people running ad blockers don't realize how much they're hurting the creators they're watching. Blocking ads has very little impact on the advertising networks because they're not paying for what they're not delivering. But the other side to this is that there are genuinely good reasons to run ad blocker. There are tons of examples of malicious code and ads being delivered, and this is not always on the part of advertising networks themselves, but the, sometimes the result of some bad third parties. And ads wind up becoming more and more intrusive as companies look for more ways to grab your attention. So here's my advice. People using Adblocker aren't usually bad people. Even if you disagree, you won't really gain anything by focusing your attention on them. So don't fight them. That said, it's fine to mention to your core audience, especially for live streaming, as many of them may make an exception for your content or purchase a, sub a subscription to your content. Avoiding unnecessary fights is also important for people stealing your work or doing other things that hinder you. You need to pick your battles. If someone steals your work and reposts it somewhere, and this could cause you to lose a very significant chunk of income, then yes, fight it. File takedown notices, do whatever you need to do. But if someone steals your work and reposts it somewhere small, it's not worth your time to pursue them to the ends of the earth. Yeah, they're a jerk, but any time you spend chasing them is time you're not spending creating new content and keeping yourself relevant. Even if you win, it's a Pyrrhic victory, meaning you've potentially lost a huge amount for a very minor gain. One last thing on the subject of monetization, which indirectly ties into contracts, which we'll be discussing next. If you're doing a good job with something that is in high demand, don't offer your work to someone else for free. Now, I'm referring specifically to content networks that look for volunteers to create major pieces of their content, with the reward being exposure for the author. I'm not referring to doing things like panel shows or collaborations, as these are usually fairly easy to set up and they can wind up offering good exposure. When I ran Tankspot, I eventually scouted for freelancers to help produce video content. I looked at our premium subscription rates and made a judgment call that most of our raid videos were going to be worth about $200 to me if they were done quickly and at a high quality. And some of the less popular guides were going to be worth about $100 to me. This was back when game videos couldn't be monetized on YouTube, so this was a fantastic rate that I offered to our freelancers, and I was still earning money on top of this. Now, we'll cover this more when talking about contracts, especially as it relates to YouTube. This freelancing model is a large part of the reason we had nearly all of our videos done within 24 hours of new content being reached, usually by people in some of the very best guilds. By the way, back then there were usually some other movies being made by players in top rating guilds, and you may remember most of them fell off, even though they did, you know, even though some of the people did a great job with them. This ties back to the problem of not being able to sustain projects you aren't earning money from. Now, after I left Tankspot, Learn to Raid and eventually Fatboss started making phenomenal raiding guides. They were extraordinarily passionate about their work, and they did a good job improving on the format. I didn't follow the WoW rating scene all that much at that point, but from what I saw, these channels were great examples of people who took a good idea and stuck with it. And in a way, this ties all the way back to talking about why gaming content from people who love games does much better than gaming content pushed by people who are only interested in the financial side. Not surprisingly, the people who love games wind up winning, and they can win financially if they take the steps for it. There's a number of different ways you can earn an income. Some of these can be done without signing contracts, such as direct sales on a product such as, such as an ebook. Uh, contracts can enable you. Good contracts will let you do amazing things. And this is especially true when you're getting started on YouTube or other platforms. I've had my share of very good contracts and a few very bad contracts. I've seen almost everything at this point. And these days, I'm very happy with my contracts because I've learned a few things about making them work for me. There are so many dangers here to be aware of, and I'm going to educate you on them. 
Each of the things I want to talk about on contracts are fairly unique from each other, so let's jump right in. First, don't trust salespeople, especially when you're the little guy. Uh, most salespeople who approach you before you've established your name are parasitic, uh, putting it kind of bluntly. Uh, and getting into a bad contract with them will absolutely sap your will to continue working on projects covered under the contract. If something sounds like a bad idea or someone gives you a bad vibe, always trust your gut instinct. That instinct is there for a reason. Never get into a contract that requires you pay someone else. There is never a good reason for you as a content creator to be paying someone else over a long period of time. Uh, and to be clear, I'm not talking about things like hiring an employee or setting up freelancing or, you know, getting in post and getting a web server or anything like that. I'm talking about and I'm also not talking about paying people for marketing. Um, so, you know, you go to an ad agency or something like that. Not talking about that. Though as a rule, you're usually not going to get your money's worth if you use generic advertising services when you earn your income primarily through advertising. In other words, don't buy expensive ads to drive traffic to, say, your YouTube channel because you're going to be running at a huge loss with relatively little potential gain. So never ever give someone login access to either your finances or your primary content delivery platforms. Uh, at one point, a company that I've worked with tried to contact Google and acquire my YouTube channel using personal information that they had on file because of the contract. Now, they did this entirely without my permission or knowledge, and fortunately, Google did a fantastic job in quickly helping to resolve the situation. But had I ever handed them the login information to my channel or my email, I may very well not be doing this today. No matter how good everything may sound, no matter how positive the relationship may look, keep in mind that in a lot of cases when you're dealing with contracts, you're dealing with salespeople. Even if they are great people, the people they work for may not be, so just be careful. A contract is a contract is a contract. In other words, it is completely binding. That is, it's binding for you when you're the little guy, but a lot of unscrupulous businesses and people have no problems with not paying you what's in your contract. They're completely reliant on the cost of legal fees, among other things, preventing you from pursuing them. And you know what? They're usually right. Be before you've established yourself, you probably won't be able to pursue legal action, both due to the cost and due to the time. So again, try to trust your gut. You get a bad instinct about something or someone. Don't pursue it. Uh, don't sign anything with anyone that will restrict all of your content or includes any kind of a non-compete agreement. You may be dealing with the most honest group of people you've ever met, but you will never know for 100% sure that they are actually as good as they sound. When you sign a contract, keep it as specific as possible. For instance, the other party may get regular written consent for, or regular written content from you, but they will not have any rights to any other projects you're doing, such as video. Or they may have rights to monetize your live streaming, but not your YouTube videos. And don't sign anything without sleeping on it first. Never, ever sign a contract when you're sitting down with a salesman for the first time. Whether high pressure or not, you really need to do your research before going forward. For everything I've said about salespeople, keep in mind that you don't want to be antagonistic. Competitive negotiation is a good thing, and checking out other options is a good thing, but keeping good relationships is as well. For all you know, you may very well work with these people again in the future, and they may very well be great people. Make sure whatever you're paid is enough to keep your interest. When you're small and looking to get ahead, the contracts you're offered are frankly not very good. You might be offered, say, a 50% 50 uh, 50 split on revenue from one company uh, when a well-known name can work with the same company and get a 90% split in their favor. On this note and related to everything else, don't sign long-term contracts. Remember, no matter who you are, if someone is offering you a contract, it means they want to work with you. I personally won't sign initial contracts with new companies for any longer than six months, and at the very least, I caution against anything longer than one year. When possible, consider whether you can afford to not be paid for the contract. I know how rough the situation can be when you're just starting out, and you can't always turn things down, but you must always be aware of the risk of simply not seeing the money you're owed. If you're going to be paid for an already finished product, make sure you receive all of the money immediately. When I signed a contract for one of my finished projects, instead of receiving the full payment up front, I was instead paid monthly over the course of many months. But before the full amount was paid out, I received an email about how something new I was working on was competing with something they were doing. 
The company had not created a single minute of content, video or otherwise, that was remotely close to anything I was doing, and they were never going to. On top of this, there, were, there, was, a non, or there was no non-compete clause in the contract, and California contract law prevents non, non-compete agreements outright. This never should have been an issue. What they were doing was attempting to bully me into producing free content for them. I was not an employee. I had no obligation to them. But they knew that they could get away with this because a significant part of the money that they owed me was still in their hands. So I wasn't going to give in, but at the same time, we also couldn't afford to not get paid. So the actual result of all this is that I stopped making the content entirely. A lot of my followers lost something they had been looking forward to. In the end, I wasn't hurt outside of not being able to pursue something I was passionate about. The company that was doing this certainly wasn't hurt, but the audience lost out in a big way. So let me emphasize again, if you're going to get paid for a product you've already created, get paid for it up front. Now, rigid daily schedules are another thing to watch out for in contracts. I'm not referring to regular delivery of products, but schedules that are meant to track you while you work, similar to keeping hours with an employer. The IRS has a fantastic site you can look up to learn more about the difference between independent contracting and employment. I'll link it below, but a Google search will usually put it right at the top. Companies can save a lot of money by treating people as employees but classifying them as contractors. In other words, if a company expects you to regularly work certain shifts, report those hours, report to regular meetings, and then tells you how to do your job and what tools to use, they're likely treating you as an employee. Now, none of these factors alone necessarily means that you are an employee. For example, if you're working on a short-term project that actually does require a lot of interaction with others, then schedules certainly aren't a killer. When I listed all the pros and cons of being self-employed, an illegal contract can kill all of the pros while still leaving you responsible for your taxes, your health insurance, and your work expenses. And I use schedules and work hour reporting as examples because they're often a huge red flag. Contracting is usually about providing an end product. The other party should not care whether you're doing the work at 10 a.m. or 10 p.m. They should only care about the product being delivered on time and at the quality they expect. So the thing to ask yourself when you're looking at a contract with a daily schedule is whether those hours have any impact on the product you've agreed to deliver in the contract. If not, something is amiss and this may not be a relationship you want to get into. Now, before we get into our final stretch on contracts, which will cover YouTube in particular, there's one last thing to keep in mind. You need to be asking for more money in contracts than you may think your work is worth. Being self-employed costs more than being employed, and contractor costs or and contractors cost companies less than employees. So, for example, if someone is employed for $40,000 a year with benefits, you should be marketing your services for the equivalent amount of work for at least $50,000 to $80,000 a year for the same stuff. Now, I'm using annual salaries, which is a little unusual in online-related contracting, but it's mostly to illustrate a point. As you establish an income and negotiate good contracts, keep in mind that you can't compare your income directly to normal employees. Let's jump into YouTube since a lot of people are looking to get their starts here. In terms of advertising, video and live streaming is where most of the advertising dollars are. First, I'm going to talk about partnering with networks, then I'm going to talk about creating videos by contract for other channels. Most of the well-known networks are good, and when you're in gaming, you'll likely need to go through them to safely monetize your work. For your own channel, you'll come across two options, fixed and unfixed CPM. Now, CPM refers to the amount of money that you're earning per thousand views. So fixed CPM says you'll be paid a certain amount uh, of money, like say $2, $1, $3, for every thousand ad-supported views. Now, don't confuse ad-supported views with your total view count uh, because this is, you know, ad block and other unmonetizable views can cut out a huge chunk of your total views. That said, fixed CPM is fantastic in that it gives you a very realistic measurement and lets you work on increasing your quality and your view counts as a mean to increasing your income. Unfixed CPM says you'll be paid a percentage of the total earnings on advertisements on your content. This is a lot more volatile, but can potentially pay you more than the fixed CPM, provided you've got a good contract and your videos pulling good numbers. Advertisers pay more for videos with higher audience retention, so you can't pump out garbage and expect to do wonderfully. This all ties back to loving what you're doing. 
YouTube and your network will get a good cut of advertising money regardless of what your contract says. When you're negotiating, don't worry about them. Just worry about pushing for the best option you can get. And if you aren't totally sure, look for a fixed CPM network to get started. By the way, once you've established yourself a bit, press your network to enable full analytics on your account so you can get a look at the actual advertising money your channel is bringing in. And for heaven's sakes, if you've established yourself, don't rush into a contract. Take the time to ask questions. Earlier this year, when I switched networks on my own channel, I spent an enormous amount of time getting into just about every detail of the contracts, and the end result was that I was more knowledgeable about ne nearly everything. I got a contract that met all of my expectations, and I was very satisfied with my final decision. So let's talk about making videos for other channels on YouTube, such as other networks. Channels that ask for your content are using your work to build their audience. They are also run by networks that often deal with direct ad sales, which means they're likely receiving better rates for their content than you'd be able to on your own. I've already said at this point that you should never be providing video content for free. Never ever sign a contract that requires your videos reach a certain number of views before you get paid. Now, I'm not talking about contracts that won't pay out until you've earned a certain threshold, such as, say, $100. I'm specifically talking about agreements where, say, if your video doesn't get at least 5,000 or 10,000 views, you'll never see a penny from it. Because, believe me, they don't need your videos to reach 10,000 views before they get advertising money, or before they can recoup the cost of simply clicking the upload button, or whatever justification they try to give. What they're masking as incentive is outright theft. So let me expand on this a little bit. If a channel is using your videos to improve their channel, that should not also mean it's your job to promote your videos on their channel. Now, if you believe in your work, you obviously should be promoting your videos on their channel, and more views is a good thing. But I'm talking about a situation where incentives such as the view thresholds we just talked about are used to get you to do all of the channel promotion. If you're making the videos for someone else's channel and you're responsibility for or, and you're responsible for promoting their channel and you're getting paid only based on the revenue their channel brings in, you are effectively doing all of their work for them. That is a parasitic relationship and you should avoid it no matter what. If you're doing a good job, do it on your own channel and put the same effort into promotion. All of this said, it's not bad to contract out with other networks to provide videos for them. It can be a decent way to get started, and it may pay well, but it's not necessarily going to bring you a lot more personal exposure. Keep in mind, all good content has worth. What you can be paid for your work is based on how much the other party will realistically earn for it. If the quality of what you're doing is worth more than what someone is capable of paying you, you may consider either pursuing it on your own or marketing it to a more established network. This is a direct analogy to pro gaming and real world sports, where really good players are often right to move to better teams. Now let's close out our contract section with one final note in regards to fan site programs and other agreements you may reach with gaming companies. Back when I was running Tankspot, I made a number of decisions uh, to help get the site into the official fan site program. If I could go back and do it again, I never would have bothered with this. First off, this is because I didn't really do anything for the site. While it may seem awesome to be featured somewhere on their official website, you have to consider whether the page where you're listed is actually visited by any significant number of people. Now, I love Riot and I love League of Legends, but I'm going to use an example from their site to illustrate this. They have a page called Featured Streamers, where a number of live streamers are showcased. Now, it might seem pretty cool to be a featured streamer on this page, but if you look at the listed programs, it's not uncommon to see top listings with only a few dozen live viewers. Now, let's say a stream on there has 24 viewers. This means that the absolute maximum viewer that Riot's official website could be directing to that stream is 24. And it's unlikely that it's anywhere near that number uh, that are all coming from just that one web page. So let that sink in. This is one of the most popular games ever made. And on a site where getting featured on the front page can bring in hundreds of thousands of visitors to a video or a streamer. But some parts of their portal see virtually zero traffic. And that's pretty standard for most big games or websites in general. It's not, again, it's not a knock at League of Legends or Riot Games here. So when you're looking at fan site uh, programs or similar agreements with big companies uh, or networks, ask yourself whether you or your friends ever actively visit those parts of the site anyway. Of course, none of this means that you shouldn't pursue a contract with them. Any publicity is good publicity. The actual question that matters is whether the restrictions placed on you are greater than the benefit.
And in many cases, they completely aren't, especially in the MMORPG scene, where a lot of these fan site programs restrict you from monetizing, restrict what types of information you're allowed to cover, even when that same information is publicly known and being talked about by the general community. So we're talking about things like data mining and things like that. By now, I've given you as much advice and information as I can on your individual projects, monetizing, and contracts. So now I want to talk about securing your work through diversification. Put simply, as you establish yourself, you want to branch out into as diverse a pool of projects as possible. More specifically, you want to create as many individual sources of income as you can reasonably maintain. The reason for this is that putting all of your eggs in one basket is a quick way to lose everything you've worked on. We've talked about the risks and the layers of vulnerability you have, and at some point, some of these are likely to fail. So for me, I do a number of different things. I sell an ebook, I create videos on my channel, I contract out to another network and create videos for them, and I work on a small handful of other projects. I also get paid from multiple sources and through multiple payment processors. What this does for me is that it makes it so no single link can break the chain that supports my family. And this security means enough to me that I'll take projects on for a little bit lower pay than I otherwise would if it adds considerably more diversity. There's another uh, concept in diversification, which is passive versus active forms of income. My ebooks are examples of passive income in that I don't need to write a new book for every customer. Individual videos, on the other hand, are something I consider an active form of income as I usually know about how many views they'll generate over time, and making new videos directly impacts my income. When you can, it's usually a good idea to get at least one passive form of income under your belt, and ideally you want to get more. As a story that may interest some people who followed tanking years ago, back when I created TankSpot, another site had been created earlier that year called Maintankadin. At one point, Ergis, the guy who created Maintankadin, contacted me. In addition to other projects of his, he was making high-quality t-shirts and we agreed to sell them on TankSpot. Completely coincidentally, we later found out that we lived very close to each other and we met up. At this point, today, we're close family friends, and being a little bit younger, we've learned a lot from them. They work on a lot of projects, but they tend to be fairly different projects than what my wife and I work on. In addition to contract work and self-directed projects, I'll give a shameless plug for their recently opened comic book store named Alter Ego at the Crossroads Mall in Bellevue. And this diversity means that between us, we have most of the skills necessary to accomplish an enormous range of projects. This is a genuine value to learning a ton of different things and consuming every subject you can, and meeting other people with this mindset can open up great opportunities, or at least great conversations. There's one final thing that I feel needs to be discussed, which is a matter of knowing when you've hit a winning idea. Let's talk about success. As of this video, my YouTube channel has nearly 180,000 subscribers. A whole lot of my higher quality videos reach into the hundreds of thousands of views, and even basic videos I publish will generally deliver tens of thousands of views. Outside of this, I have other places I've established myself as well. By any objective measurement, I'm successful in this field, but to me, I still look at this as though I'm near the bottom of the ladder. And I think that's healthy, and that desire to improve and expand and all is, you know, it's always going to be there so long as I love what I'm doing. Now, let me talk about evaluating success in two different ways. First, regarding how you can know when self-employment is worth pursuing, and second being how you can know when your individual projects are winners. I believe the first time I realized I should pursue this as my career was when I earned just $100 from doing, you know, from doing this work. And I'm not talking about donations, but actual money earned, in my case, from advertisements. It sounds small compared to the money I had put into the projects, but that first check was a sign that what I was doing was working, and it was incredibly motivating. But what about your projects? Separate of starting to see money, how do you know if an individual project is a winner, or if you need to scrap it and try a different idea? First off, let me give you a huge piece of advice. Do not ever associate the views you receive with the quality of your content. When you're starting out and the view counts are small, view counts can be completely misleading, as well as demoralizing. The same goes with activity on a website. One rule of thumb I learned early was that only about 10% of your visitors will ever register to your site and participate in discussions. This number was fairly accurate in the projects I've worked on. So just because you're not seeing a lot of discussions taking place on your work doesn't mean that people aren't starting to pay attention. 
By the way, install some form of analytics on your projects as soon as you can to anything you're doing. Uh, you really want to see hard data to help determine what people are enjoying and not enjoying, as well as determining how traffic flows are occurring. If you remember what I said about people who give constructive criticism not always being right, the opposite is true as well. Close-knit audiences have a tendency to create an echo chamber where you, might, you, where you may not be seeing serious flaws in your work that are preventing others from jumping in and enjoying your content. So here are my very basic rules for determining whether something is potentially successful and whether it has long-term value. First, are you seeing regular and consistent growth in the number of people looking at your content, and are they coming from different places? You don't, again, you don't want to be just expanding from friends of the people who are already in your audience. You ideally want to have a broader reach than that. Second, is your content timely? Does it fill a niche, or is it better than your competition? And have people noticed this, and comp have they made comments about it? Third, is any of your content getting linked or promoted by other people either on a site like Reddit or in official forums uh, or even on guild or clan websites or other small you know, community websites? Fourth, are you proud of your work and do you love your work and does your work convey that enthusiasm to your audience? If these factors are all in your favor, then stick to it. Even if you're only getting 500 views on a video, for instance, that's still a lot more than most people get when they start and it's a good starting point. For YouTube, you'll know you've got a strong basis for long-term success once you've gained at least 5,000 subscribers and are seeing at least 1,000 views on your videos. Uh, but this also comes down to whether your work is going to appeal to a mass audience or not. If you're covering a game that's only sold 50,000 copies, it may not matter whether you're the number one content creator for that audience or not, as your potential audience has a low hard cap, it's going to be hard to grow in that field. Again, as long as you enjoy it, play what people are playing, because that's how you're going to reach out to a bigger audience. If you feel your idea isn't doing well, don't commit yourself to something that isn't working. Don't finish out a project that isn't going to pan out. Just because you've invested a lot into a project doesn't mean you need to finish it. And if it won't pan out, look at how you can improve and move on. Keep trying things until they get traction. So let me close with this. Success is exponential. Gaining more views does more than simply getting you paid more. It also accelerates your growth and makes you more marketable, which leads to better contracts. So if you make $100, you can make $1,000 or $100,000 if your potential audience is big enough. Be proud of that $100 because it's a fantastic foundation to get started. And by the way, it's worth saying again, avoid long-term contracts. You never know when you're going to strike big, and you'll almost certainly be able to get a better deal once you get there. As we close this, I want to talk about all of this a little differently. Never forget that real wealth is in your family and friends. Your relationships define you. This happens to be a video about making money and making a living, but as many of you know, this is not anywhere near my regular subject matter. I would never have made this if I didn't honestly believe it would help a lot of people out there in pursuing their dreams. If this helped you and you wish to repay the favor in some way, check out a site named kiva.org and consider lending $25 to an entrepreneur in real need. These people lift their communities up and they repay their loans. And of course, please like this video and let people know about it.